Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Today, I'm going to be presenting a lecture about processing of partial dentures. In the previous lecture, we had discussed about uh, tooth setup and wax up of partial dentures. Uh, after the tooth setup is completed, now you'll be subjecting the partially dentulous arches to uh, laboratory processing for completion of this complete denture, of this partial dentures in acrylic. So for this uh, processing of partial dentures in acrylic, we must understand a few laboratory procedures. Uh, since uh, the laboratory processes were missing in our lectures, so I wanted to show some videos regarding the laboratory processing so that you can always refer them back to the lecture once you come in the laboratory setup. After the, uh, coming on to the next slide, after the wax up and tooth setup is completed, this is more or less the picture that is going to be on your partially dentulous arches. And you will be noticing that the, all of the wax patterns are all completed. But remember, this is not the final tooth setup. You will be, uh, if you haven't made any wrought white clasps for this acrylic partial dentures, then you will be required to place those, acrylic, those uh, metal stainless steel wires or clasps on the adjacent abutment teeth before you finalize the process. So for this purpose, the, uh, I would say that this, if you are going to add uh, wrought wire clasps to this, uh, or direct retainers to this uh, partially dentulous arch, then this process is still not yet complete. Then what you would require to do is that you will be removing these saddle areas, these artificial teeth, uh, the whole part of it, not just the teeth, the, the whole part of the saddle. And then you'll be adding clasps, which I'll be discussing in the next slide. So uh, this is the situation that if you want to add a clasp, which is a direct retainer, and in an acrylic partial denture, the direct retainer for is going to more commonly used as uh, basically a, uh, a wrought wire clasp. So what you will be doing is you'll be removing this part of the saddle, whole part, as can be seen in this picture. The whole part of the saddle is removed and then it can always be added back to this framework or this wax pattern. And the next step is that you'll be adding a clasp in this uh, uh, area where the, this is going to be the potential abutment tooth. <coughs> And you'll be adding it to a clasp on this on this abutment. You'll be adding a clasp on this abutment. Similarly, over here and this teeth. So a clasp will be added in this, and then these uh, artificial teeth or the saddles will be replaced back. But the other option is that if you can make a clasp in the beginning, and then do the setup according to the clasp, because the problem that arises is that these teeth would require some space so that the clasp can be added and incorporated in between because the clasp has its own thickness as can be seen over here. This is a 0.7 millimeter wire, stainless steel wire, and obviously it, it occupies some space by itself. So it would be advisable that when, when, you, start, when you start doing a setup, you always place a make a clasp first and then you do the setup so that you can incorporate the space occupied by the, by the clasp within the artificial teeth and then the, the, the subsequent work would be less. So the armamentarium required to make a clasp, uh, a wrought wire clasp. Remember, a wrought wire clasp is that type of a clasp which is made by bending a straight wire a, a wire like this as you can as can be seen in this in this picture this is a 0.5 to 0.7 millimeter stainless steel wire so this is bent into different shapes the one the the, the, the type of shape that is required and that is why it is called a wrought wire clasp the other type of direct retainer is a cast clasp the cast clasp is basically made in a wax pattern and that wax pattern is then subjected to a casting process where that wax is, is burnt out and then in that space that is, uh, uh, that is created by the burnt out wax, molten metal takes its place and then that is called a cast clasp. Now you must have been told about this in, in dental materials, the casting process, so that is uh, a part of the casting process. So, 
The Rottweil clasp is not subjected to any casting process. It is made by bending the different wire into different shapes. So the, the pliers that you would, would require is a flat plier, a round plier, a three-prong plier, and an Adams plier. And in addition to this, you will need a wire cutter that is going to be used to cut this wire. <clears throat> the most commonly used pl pliers are the Adam plier and the three-prong plier, as well as a round plier to bend the wire into different uh, rounded shapes. So I normally use the Adam plier and the, three, and the round plier, yet the three-prong plier has its own benefits and it's quite easy to use with this also. So if you have bought this, uh, it's very good to uh, start using this, this plier, but if you haven't uh, invested in this plier, this is a, a long-term investment, it's very good, do, do buy this and it's going to give full benefit to your work in the laboratory. So I had already shown this video before, but I'm going to show it again, just as a revision on, on how to uh, start with the, um, uh, on how to make a Rottweil clasp. <coughs> You just see it's not starting right now. Let's have a look. So the first process is that whenever you make a uh, clasp, notice that over here, this is the Now this area, the point over here that I want you to make is that this is the area where this is the maximum bulge of any tooth. This cast has been surveyed and this, the, the surveyor has denoted or marked this line as the maximum bulge of a tooth. Whenever you're going to make a clasp, a wrought wire clasp or a cast clasp, please make sure that the terminal portion of the clasp whether it's a wrought wire clasp or a cast clasp, the terminal portion of the clasp is supposed to be in between the area which is called the infra bulge area. Now this infra bulge area is the area between the maximum bulge of the tooth and the cervical area. So another name for this infra bulge area is called the undercut area. So the required or the acceptable range of undercut for a premolar is between 0.25 millimeters to 0.5 millimeters. So uh, this is the area which is ideal for a premolar. Anything less than 0.25 millimeters is basically not an undercut and anything more than 0.5 millimeters for a premolar is basically a too heavy undercut for a premolar. So you need to readjust the position or choose another tooth. So <clears throat> coming back to the topic, uh, you'll be deciding, uh, you'll be placing a clasp at the tip. The tip of the terminal portion of the clasp is going to be in this undercut area. And once this has been done, uh, as you can see with the pencil, the technician is marking the position where the clasp is going to be. It's just below the maximum bulge area. You're not going to put the clasp too much in the cervical area. Notice that he is also mentioning that the the clasp is not going to be uh, if you can see over here notice that he is pointing that notice that the wire that the line that he has made and this is the wire the line for the wire the clasp that is going to be placed over here he has made it and it's not going now going to shift upwards above the maximum bulge area if you place a clasp in this area the way that he is pointing the, with the pencil that means that this all of this area is an undercut area. So if you place a clasp, the, the, the proximal portion of the clasp in this undercut area, uh, it's not going to help in, in inserting of the denture, it's going to get stuck. And what you would be doing is then you would be uh, reducing the, this acrylic and eventually you'll, you will be cutting off the clasp also. So ideally, you should be placing the wire, bending the wire and bringing it up above the maximum bulge area or if you want you can place a clasp but it should be away from this area it should be away from this area and beyond this area so uh, <clears throat> now he's he's drawing a line that this which is going to follow the, the the shape of the clasp that is going to be made in now 
<coughs> so now he's going to be uh, smoothing out the rough edges of the, the straight stainless steel wire. Uh, remember, now he's using a three-prong plier and with a small bend, with a small force, he's just bending the wire. As you can see, that he's bending the wire, not, not fully, but to a shape that is going to be fitting in this cervical area of this, uh, of this uh, tooth. Now, similarly with the pencil, then he's going to mark the position where he's going to bend, give a bend more. And uh, <coughs> from there, he's marking the position. Now, from this point onwards, he's going to uh, bend the wire to the other side. Note, remember that the marking on the wire helps a lot in uh, guiding your own self in making and bending the shape of the, of the clasp into, of the wire into a clasp. So this is how it's going to be. Uh, it is slightly uh, uh, frustrating in the beginning, but then remember that everything comes with practice, so you keep on practicing more and more, and then you'll be uh, a perf perfection, you'll, have, you'll gain perfection in making this, uh, this clasp. So he's making a C clasp. So remember that he's, he's making marks on the wire, and from there on he starts bending, and accordingly, he is now able to make the clasp or the, the buckle portion of the clasp in such a way that it's totally and very closely adapted on the buckle surface of this tooth. Another position, he's, he's marked that from here onwards he's going to bend the wire and convert it in towards the proximal side. Notice that he places the single, single prong of the three prong plier on the other side from, from where he wants to bend it. And this is how it's easy to bend this way. With, a, with an Adams plier, you need to bend it with your own thumbs and it uh, requires a lot of pressure also. <clears throat> the same position, he's now placing it, he's now extending it towards the lingual side, uh, the, the wire. He has bent it over here. In all this process, it requires repetition. You need to keep on checking again and again by, by placing the clasp on the tooth and seeing which is the most appropriate position. It takes normally five to 10 minutes to make a clasp like this. Uh, notice that the clasp has to be closely adapted to the buccal surface of this tooth. If it's not closely adapted, it's not going to engage any undercut and it's not going to engage the tooth. Now, from this point onwards, he's now a marking on the wire so that from this point onwards he is going to bend this wire towards the lingual sulcus and from there onwards uh, the next step is going to be made. Notice, please note that he, at the end of this uh, whole demonstration he is going to bend the wire into a different shape and that is going to be because acrylic and metal does not have any affinity so you need to make a, a mechanical interlocking area which is going to, on which the acrylic is going to wrap around and it's going to hold the uh, wire in itself. So from here onwards, he's going to bend the wire towards the lingual sulcus and uh, that's what he's doing. This is how it's going to be that you have to re-bend, make a U-shape or an L-shape uh, bend at the end. With a wire cutter, he's going to cut out the excess part and this is going to give him an idea that the clasp is now properly adapted. Uh, if you notice, I'll just show you in this uh, video right now. If you notice that this is the point that he's, he has made. Now, if you see over here, there is a gap between the wire and this tissue surface. This gap is important to make. If you don't make this gap, then that means that uh, this gap is important in the sense that acrylic has to flow around this wire. And if it flows around this wire, then it means that acrylic has, has properly held the wire in its position, in its place. Otherwise, uh, what happens normally is that if you don't keep this gap between the wire and the tissue surface, uh, after curing process, uh, people have uh, just lost their class because the acrylic 
was pretty far away from the wire and it just came out of the of the um, the denture base so make sure that there is adequate space and this adequate space has to be on the lingual side not on the buckle side please make sure that the buckle aspect of the wire is supposed to be in close proximity close contact with the buckle surface so don't keep any space on the buckle side but the only space that is required is on the lingual side so he's checking the amount of adequate space uh, if any excess wire is to be cut out he's going to cut that out or make a more bend now this bend over there that he's at the end of it that he that you'll be seeing he is uh, this the sharp bend <coughs> now this is important now this is going to create a mechanical interlock this is going to create some mechanical interlock and the acrylic flows around it and then as I had mentioned before, that metal and acrylic does not have any, any chemical affinity. So you need to have a mechanical form of a lock so that acrylic holds this uh, stainless steel wire in itself. So some sort of a, a U-shaped bend at the, at the end of the fabrication of the clasp or a simple L-shaped bend is going to hold the clasp in acrylic. So once you have made the clasps, this is going to be the position. As I mentioned, the L-shaped bend at the end over here, similarly L-shaped bend over here, th this is going to help in holding the clasp in acrylic. Uh, otherwise, you can easily pull out the clasp from the acrylic if this bend is not there. So this is going to make an, a, a, a mechanical lock. <coughs> Now, after this, the clasps are adapted on the desired abutments, the ones that are made. Uh, if you see over here, this clasp is not properly made. It has to cover, it has to circle the whole of the buckle side. This is not the properly adapted clasp. It needs to, it's just on the buckle aspect. It's not covering on the proximal side also. So this is not going to engage the undercut if there is any undercut here. Uh, but uh, just to note that you just wanted to let you know that the clasp on the buckle aspect should be covering all of the buckle surface. Now all of these clasps are then adapted on the on the casts with the help of a sticky wax or you can adapt them with a base plate wax but remember base plate wax comes off easily so a sticky wax is ideal. You can also use self cure acrylic to hold these clasps in their position from and add them on the buckle aspect so that they don't move during the process of uh, uh, acrylic processing and the tooth setup. Now how do you adapt the base plate on the so once the base plate, once the clasps are made, you place the wax pattern back again as it had already been cut out and wax space had already, already been created for the clasps. So then the wax base plate is sealed back on the cast and the teeth which were cut out, uh, those teeth which are going to come in close proximity with this clasp, you might need to adjust from the inner side. If you can adjust on the inner side, then you will be sure that the teeth will be seating on this area quite easily and it won't be too high or too, uh, too far ab away from their own position. So after you have uh, uh, adjusted the teeth from the inner side, these teeth from the inner side, you place these saddles back in their original position and without and you must make sure that there is no hindering of the teeth on and with the clasp you have to create you have to accommodate them by reducing from the inner side of the tooth as i had mentioned that if this process is done in the beginning then while this set tooth setup process is undertaken then you won't have to go through all this process again as it becomes quite tedious and cumbersome at the end that you have to do the whole process again so i would advise that whenever you go for a tooth setup you uh, once you've done the clasp and then you're going for a tooth setup do the tooth setup with the clasp in position so that you don't you won't have any problems at the end once the sealing is once the wax pattern is completed uh, this I had shown in the previous lecture of, of uh, tooth setup. You have to make sure that the wax pattern, the denture flanges should be contoured and smoothed, smoothened to provide a pleasing appearance. Now this is uh, more of a, a high-tech performance of a wax pattern design, giving more stippling of, uh, on the wax pattern just to create a more uh, uh, natural appearance. 
Now the distal extension saddle areas should be maximally covered to, for better support of uh, tissue support. In the mandible, the distal extension bases should be covered till the retromolar pad. In the maxilla, the distal extension bases should be extending towards the hamular notch, uh, which, is quite, which is the most proximal limit of any maxillary denture. <coughs> and the waxed up uh, denture flanges should not be extended into the soft tissue undercuts. If there is a soft tissue undercut over here, which means a bony prominence and the soft tissue is covering that area, don't extend this, uh, this wax pattern beyond that maximum bulge of this, of that soft tissue, uh, uh, soft tissue bulge. Because then it won't, you will be able to make a denture, but then you won't be able to insert it back on the cast or you won't be able to insert it in the patient's mouth because, without injuring the patient's gingiva. So till the maximum bulge of any tooth. Now this we can always identify with the help of a surveyor or uh, the surveying process. Notice this is the maximum bulge which was marked by the surveyor and this black line is also the maximum bulge which was marked by the surveyor surveying process. And this is going to guide us that we're not going to extend our denture parts of the dentures beyond that maximum bulge because beyond that is going to create an undercut area. <clears throat> Similar over here that this is the bulge over here. If you notice that there is a shiny part and this is a bulge. So if you extend the, uh, the flange beyond this, it, you will be able to make, <coughs> excuse me, you'll be able to make a denture but then you won't be able to insert it back in the patient's mouth. So please make sure that whenever you finishing the, the wax patterns, make sure that it is not extending beyond the maximum bulge on the soft tissues. Now, you are also supposed to make sure that the, the, the denture flanges should be carefully contoured and smoothed. Smooth surfaces should be made so that they blend with the soft tissues. There shouldn't be a, a, a step over there which is going to create an anesthetic appearance. Remove excess wax from the teeth uh, expose the tooth as much as possible because then that creates more aesthetics. Uh, notice that this is your, you're making a, a partial denture for a patient. So you must, your, the artificial teeth that you're going to place should have the cervical levels at the same level as the opposing uh, natural tooth. That creates more aesthetic appearance. Uh, if you create a pretty long tooth, that is not going to be aesthetic. And if you create a pretty shorter tooth, with a lot of wax on it, that's not going to be more aesthetic also. So try to follow the adjacent tooth uh, cervical margins. After the wax pattern, uh, after the, the clasps has, have been made and seated in their respective positions, the wax pattern is finished again and occlusal contacts are checked on the articulator that the, the ones that you had made before the removal of the saddle areas for clasps, the wax patterns, the occlusal contacts are in their same position that were pre-made before removing the wax. Now after you have completed all of this, after the wax pattern is completed, now comes the process of the laboratory process in which we are going to go for uh, acrylic processing. Now this is going to be done by removal of the casts from the articulator and this we, we do with this process that we use a plaster knife and we just tap on the articulator surfaces and eventually this comes off uh, without breaking the cast. Remember you're not supposed to break the cast you're just going to tap on the soft plaster and on the border between the hard and the soft plaster and it comes off uh, quite easily. In this way, you, are, you, are, you can make sure that your cast is all safe and it is not damaged. <coughs> so after this, the next step is that you're going to, to, you're going to go for a cleaning of your flasks. The type of class, flasks that you have is a college pattern flask and this is an, the other type of uh, flask which is also used. This is slightly bigger, but it has the same components as the, the, the type of flask that you have. Now this flask and the one that you have, both of them have these three members. One is a lower member, it has a lid inside, the upper member, and it has a top lid on the flask. And all of these components are together. Now you have to clean the flask from the inner side. You should make sure that there are no excess plaster 
which was uh, which is which got stuck because of the previous uh, use of the uh, flasking process if there is any plus you also make sure that the <coughs> clasps are the, the sorry the flasks are all clean and they are fitting into in properly so if they are fitting in properly uh, you must make sure that the upper and the lower members all fit together without any gap in between then what you're going to do is you'll be applying Vaseline in between the inner surface of this flask. Uh, application of Vaseline is important or petroleum jelly is important in the sense that once you go for the flasking process you can be quite sure that the plaster the soft plaster is not going to get stuck in the rough surfaces of this flask. Similarly it is also going to prevent any oxidation process any rust that comes up on the flask. So this Vaseline is going to help in acting as a separating medium. This Vaseline is supposed to be applied on all the surfaces of the flask, the inner surfaces, the top surface, and the top lid also, which is going to come in contact with the plaster. So after this, you are going to go for this fitting of the, the uh, partial, partially edentulous arches with the wax pattern inside in the flask. So this process I'll be showing you in this video. <clears throat> so make sure that the uh, once the, the separated cast from the articulator, you place it in the flask and there has to be adequate space between the cast members, the cast borders and the border of the inner border of the flask. If there is no space, then you need to trim the cast to such a, in such a way that it can be fitted inside. For this, I would recommend to see my video on YouTube which with a channel of preclinical prosthodontics. Search for the channel on YouTube preclinical prosthodontics and in that I have shown a video about fitting of the cast in the, in the respective flask, how to do it and how to use a trimmer. So once this is done, uh, you place the upper member, the middle part of the upper flask and then <clears throat> You make sure that there is adequate space between the tooth surfaces of the, uh, artific uh, the artificial tooth and the upper member. I repeat it again. So, <clears throat> so this is the situation. This is the college pattern flask that you all have. Notice the amount of uh, soft plaster that is stuck. This is to be removed and if you if you're able to remove all of this then you will be applying Vaseline on all the inner surfaces of this flask on all both of them. You'll also be applying Vaseline on the <coughs> You'll also be applying Vaseline on the cast also. You'll be applying Vaseline not on the wax pattern but you'll be applying Vaseline on the cast, the, the hard plaster for all the surfaces so that it can be easily separated after the flasking process is complete. The next step is <coughs> that you'll be pouring in type 2 investment. This is soft plaster, type 2 plaster. Uh, the, you'll be pouring in this plaster, you mix it and you'll pour in the lower member of the flask. After this, you'll be applying, you'll be, you'll be placing this cast in the center, push it downwards and make sure that uh, there is, it comes in contact with the lower base. <coughs> Similarly, remove the excess plaster as can be seen in this uh, video. The technician is removing excess plaster but he's also covering the, the, the tooth on the cast but he's not covering the tooth of the, the artificial teeth. You have to expose the artificial teeth, expose the wax pattern as much as possible. I would say that you should expose all of the wax pattern, expose all of the teeth, as can be seen in this video, and make the wax pattern smooth. It has to be smooth because if this wax, if, if this plaster that you've applied here, <coughs> if this is rough, and there are undercuts in this plaster, the opposing member will get stuck in it, as you will be seeing in the next uh, subsequent videos. He is now smoothening out this plaster pattern with a, with a toothbrush or you can use a Scotch-Brite for this. After this, 
after the smoothening out, <coughs> you can see that the surfaces of the, the pattern is all smooth, all clear. There is no rough edges. All the surfaces are smooth be, uh, by the use of a toothbrush or a scotch brite. Any abrasive material that can help in reducing any rough edges. Notice there is supposed to be no undercuts, especially in this front area or on the back area. If you can see from the top and you can see the slope going downwards all, all together, that means that this surface is all smooth and there is no undercut in this area. The next step is the application of Vaseline again on this plaster. This, is going to, this application of Vaseline is going to act as a separating medium between the middle part of the flask in which the plaster is going to be poured in the next step. So you must always apply Vaseline. Do not apply Vaseline on the artificial teeth. Do not apply Vaseline on the wax patterns because then uh, this is still going to be taken out once the de-waxing process is complete. So Vaseline is applied uh, on the soft plaster area, not on the artificial teeth or any other area. Uh, just make sure that you apply Vaseline adequately. <clears throat> now the middle part is applied. The middle member of the flask is, is placed on this, uh, sorry, repeat it again. So, <clears throat> so this is the situation. After the wax pattern is, after the flasking process, this process is called flasking. After this process is completed, notice the amount, this is, this is the slope going downwards. This slope is supposed to be present. This means that there is no undercut. Over here, this is the maxillary uh, cast and the flask, and there are some rough edges. This needs to be smoothened out before the middle part is completed. <clears throat> application the separating medium which is a vaseline it is applied on all the the plaster surfaces not on the artificial teeth or the wax pattern because these artificial teeth will come in the opposing member of the flask and the wax pattern is going to be eliminated so you don't need to apply anything on this wax pattern or the artificial teeth <coughs> <coughs> i'm sorry the next step is uh, using type 3 dental stone and this type 3 dental stone is basically hard plaster. You can use a mixture of hard plaster and soft plaster <clears throat> and you can also use type 3 dental stone altogether. You will be placing the middle member of the flask and pouring in, soft pl and the pouring in hard plaster. This is going to cover all of the, uh, the uh, wax pattern and the cast. Remember, you are supposed to apply Vaseline before you, you start this process. If you don't apply Vaseline, this, soft, this hard plaster will get stuck with the soft plaster and all of the hard work that you have done before is going to go waste. Then you, can't, you won't be able to separate it. So it's absolutely important to place Vaseline. Once the, the flask is uh, filled to the brim of the... Uh, the, up, the middle member, then you can place the top lid and once you place the top lid as you, as you had seen here <clears throat> this is the, it's filled to the brim, the top lid is pressed and excess plaster is going to come out. This means that there is no gap in between. Remember, in doing all of this process, you must keep on tapping the flask also so that there are no air bubbles incorporated in between. So this is the step that, is, uh, that we have done in our lab also. The, <clears throat> the flask is filled to the top uh, with hard plaster. Some artificial teeth are still showing here. Uh, we, you can do this step. This is also called a three-pour technique in which the top is not filled to the brim. Uh, it's allowed to set and then we apply another layer of Vaseline on this surface and then we pour another layer of uh, soft hard plaster. So you can use both of the techniques. <coughs> as this is a three pour technique uh, as, as seen on the heading also. 
uh, we have the, some artificial teeth are visible. This uh, the three pore technique benefit is that the, the hard plaster, the top layer is the hard plaster, the middle layer on this is a mixture of hard and soft plaster and the bottom layer is just soft plaster. So this hard plaster is going to hold these teeth in their position and it won't let them move out. So this is also one benefit of uh, uh, the three pore technique. So it's then filled to the brim as, as can be seen in this and the top lid is then placed on the top member and excess plaster comes out easily and this means that our flask is now completely filled. Then the, the, <coughs> the flask is then placed back in its, in its chamber and then the flask is placed in boiling water for 10 minutes. <coughs> You can also see the same video of de-waxing in my YouTube channel, uh, Preclinical Prosthodontics. Uh, the flask is then, as this is a uh, boiling unit, uh, you can also use in boiling pots uh, that we have in our, in our labs also. So for 10 minutes, it's placed in boiling water. And after 10 minutes, the, these flasks are opened up. <coughs> Care should be taken that you should be wearing uh, thick gloves because the, the flasks are quite hot when you're opening them up. <clears throat> so after this, as you can see over here, as I had mentioned, that the, uh, in the de-waxing process, if you have adequately applied Vaseline, this is going to be easily separated. If you don't apply Vaseline as a separating medium, this hard plaster is not going to separate from this soft plaster and all of the, your work is going, going to go waste. Plus, you must also note that if there are undercuts present in the surface, undercut means that any bulge which is going to, uh, which is not in a, in a downward slope, uh, this hard plaster on the, the second part of the, the flask is going to get engaged in it and you won't be able to remove or open the flask. So make sure that that step is quite uh, done with quite a lot of meticulous care. So after the de-waxing, after you take, off the, take out the flask from the hot water, you will see that this is molten wax, that this is also a, a temporary base plate which was made. They are going to remove this temporary base plate and the teeth would be present in the opposing side. So this is the step in which they are going to remove this temporary base plate and if you notice that this, the teeth that were placed in the wax pattern, now they have come in the opposite side of the, up, the upper chamber and the lower chamber would have a wax pattern. Uh, would have a, would have the clasps and the cast. So uh, again, hot water is poured in this. This is uh, necessary to eliminate any residues of base plate wax that are left behind. Remember, you are supposed to pour in hot water. Hot water is supposed to be clean. It should not be the same wax uh, water which is used in boiling pots. So this helps in elimination of all the wax from the casts. The, the second step in this de-waxing process is, as you can see over here, is the application of cold mold seal. Now this is another form of a separating medium. The, other, the first form was the Vaseline or the petroleum jelly as a separating medium. This is a, uh, a cold mold seal. It is a sodium, sodium alginate solution which is applied on the, on the plaster surfaces. Now this separating medium, this sodium alginate or cold mold seal is used whenever we're going for packing of acrylic. So uh, for acrylic packing, you're, you're not going to use Vaseline or petroleum jelly, you're going to use cold mold seal. The other solution, the other uh, separating mediums are the soap solutions or the tin foil. Uh, but we'll be using cold mold seal, which is readily available. So you'll be copiously applying the cold mold seal with an applicator brush, and you'll be applying in all the surfaces of this cast. Remember, this was a cast where the tooth setter was done. So there is no teeth. The, tooth, the teeth are now present in the opposing member. So here you'll be applying cold mold seal. <clears throat> but you have to apply in one direction, in unidirection. You're not going to move to and fro all together, this is going to create clumps. On the middle member, you'll be applying cold mold seal 
but make sure that you don't apply cold mold seal on the tooth surfaces because you want to have we want to have an affinity we want to have a chemical bond between the acrylic that is going to be packed and the acrylic teeth that are present so uh, make sure that you don't apply any cold mold seal on the uh, acrylic teeth and also on the clasps <clears throat> So after the devaxing process, uh, what we've done in our lab, uh, this is going to be the devaxed uh, flask for the lower arch. And this is the opposing, the teeth are now present in the opposing uh, member. We'll be pouring in hot water, clear hot water, uh, so that we remove all of the residues of the flask, of the wax that, uh, that are left behind. <coughs> Then we'll be applying cold mold seal. This is the cold mold seal bottle. It's also written cold mold seal. This is a separating medium. Whenever you're going to go for uh, uh, acrylic packing and uh, acrylic curing process, you are going to apply cold mold seal on all the surfaces, but you'll, be re you'll remove cold mold seal from the clasps. Also, you won't be applying cold mold seal on the tooth surfaces because you want to have a close chemical bond between the base plate and the, these teeth. Next comes packing the mold with acrylic resin and processing of acrylic resin. A few, a slight introduction about acrylic resin. The, the acrylic that is used for denture based construction is heat cured acrylic. There are two types of acrylics, the heat cured acrylic and autopolymerizing acrylic. In heat cured acrylic, <coughs> the polymerization process is activated by heat, whereas in, in autopolymerizing or cold cure or self cured acrylic, a chemical activator is used for the polymerization process. Now the time that is uh, to reach the dough stage, which is a stage in which you'll be packing acrylic, it depends on the solubility of the polymer and the monomer. Mo the, it, the acrylic comes in two parts, one is a liquid and the other one is a, is a powder. So the, the size of the polymer particle also depends and the smaller the size of the particle, the smaller the, the, the shorter the time of polymerization process. So acrylic, the heat cure acrylic comes in these forms. This is the monomer, uh, it comes in a bottle and this is a powder which comes in packets. Uh, so uh, you must make sure that the, the, both the, uh, the packet and the bottle should contain the word heat cure. If there is another one which would, be, uh, which would have the term self-cure so you can't mix self-cure liquid with self with heat cure powder or you can't mix self-cure powder with heat cure liquid that is not going to clear, complete the polymerization process these are two different processes so make sure both of them have the same name <clears throat> so the mixing stages of acrylic are when you, whenever you mix uh, uh, liquid monomer into the polymer it, the initial stage is going to be the sandy stage and after some time, the, there is going to be strings of fibrous stage when the monomer starts to attack the polymer. In this stage, the, the, the mix is tacky, sticky and adheres to the sides of the mixing jar and also on your fingers. After this comes this smooth dough-like stage and this is the stage in which acrylic packing is required. And after the acrylic, the dough stage comes the rubber-like stage and this is the stage where acrylic packing is not possible. And after the rubber, rubber stage comes the plastic stage which, in which the acrylic hardens. So how do you mix acrylic? You measure, <coughs> make sure that hands are clean or you can use disposable gloves uh, for this purpose. You mix, measure and mix the polymer and monomer according to the manufacturer's directions. Uh, usually 10 cc of monomer and 30 cc of polymer are used. First, pour the monomer into a clean porcelain jar and then add the polymer because you have already pre-judged uh, uh, or pre-used uh, 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 the monomer in a calibrated form. So you will pour the monomer into a clean jar and then you will add polymer. This is, you stir with a clean spatula till the monomer and polymer are thoroughly combined. Place the lid on the jar and allow the mixture to stand till it reaches the dough stage, indicated by which you can use a timer also. So uh, the, the, it, this is quite easy that the dough stage can be easily separated from the, from the walls of the jar and it won't be sticking to your fingers. Normally, uh, depending on the temperature and depending on the amount of mixture that you are using, uh, it takes around uh, 5 to 10 to 15 minutes depending on the room temperature also. <coughs> 
So this is the initial stage. Uh, you pour, this is the polymer, polymer powder or the heat cured acrylic powder. So you can pour it in a, in a jar and uh, in a porcelain cup or whatever, which is clean and smooth. But don't you use plastic because then acrylic will stick to that plastic also. So then you'll, you can pour in 10 cc of monomer <clears throat> and you can start mixing it. You mix in such a way that all of the monomer is uh, mixed with the polymer powder and all of it is completely, it, it's a thorough mix, a homogeneous mix. There are no clumps in between. So after this comes the stringy stage. It can be indicated in this way that this is the stringy stage. The acrylic is still not in a packable state. The stringy stage means that there are, if you separate your fingers, there are going to be strings formed and still this is uh, in a more sticky stage. You need to uh, wait a little bit longer. <clears throat> So this is the dough stage. The dough stage is just uh, is a very smooth, soft stage, but it will not be sticking to your fingers. But throughout this time, make sure that your hands are wet and they're clean also. So once you reach this stage, this is the packing stage. <clears throat> now, once this stage is, is, is achieved, remember this is a very short-lived uh, stage and you have to work quite quickly while packing off acrylic. So uh, <clears throat> you pack the material in the upper half of the flask before being sure to press it all well around. And you must make sure that the upper member, once you've packed acrylic, uh, <clears throat> you're supposed to press the flask all together downwards and the, both the upper and the lower members should meet together. So use enough material to ensure overpacking of the first closure. Place two pieces of wet cellophane over the acrylic resin. Now this is called a trial closure. It, this is helpful in the sense that you can make sure that all the acrylic has flowed in properly. The, now you put the lower half of the flask in a position and press the flask together using hand pressure. You can place it in a, in a bench press and close it slowly so that all the acrylic comes out. The excess acrylic flows out. Uh, you will remove the flask from the press Open it carefully, trim off the excess acrylic, which is called acrylic flash with a sharp knife. And note, and you will check if there are any discrepancies in acrylic packing, if there are any voids. If there are any voids, place more though that the same acrylic excess that had been come up, that came out of the flask, you place it back, uh, you pack it back and close it again and do the trial closure again with a cellophane sheet. <clears throat> so acrylic mixed together, the dough stage reached. The dough is then packed in the upper member of the, uh, uh, the flask. <clears throat> in the, sorry, the, in, the, in this, the lower member is used, but it should be ideally in the upper member. And then the upper member is placed back on the flask. <clears throat> you will place cellophane sheet before placing the upper member. Place cellophane sheet in between and then close it and place it in a press. Once you close it and place it in a press, this means that uh, excess acrylic will be flowing out and then you will open the flask again carefully, remove this cellophane sheet and you will see if there are... Now this uh, acrylic packing is not for partial dentures. This is a picture shown for a uh, complete denture. But you will notice and you will, you will judge any, any discrepancies, any voids present. And if there are any voids, the same acrylic flash will be placed over there and the same process will be done again. Now this will help in determining, in making sure that there are no voids left behind. So the processing or polymerization of acrylic resin is the conversion of the monomer to the polymer when a mixture of the two is subjected to heat in water bath. The amount of heat must be controlled while processing acrylic resin as the reaction is exothermic and becomes very rapid at temperatures between 60 and 71 degrees. Once the polymerization has begun, the temperature of the resin may become higher than the temperature of the water bath. So the boiling point of monomer is 100 degrees centigrade. So this is an exothermic reaction. So make sure that if, if, you, if you increase the temperature quite quickly, this is going to lead to, uh, to loss of monomer from the, from the polymer and this is going to lead to some small holes in the, in the acrylic uh, base plate that is called porosity. So you don't want this to happen. Those, those porosities, those small holes that form in the acrylic uh, base plate 
uh, would lead to uh, a, a weak, weak denture base. Similarly, it would lead to accumulation of uh, plaque in that area, bacteria, and eventually smell would be there. So you need to have a, a smooth and uh, properly cured denture base. So for that reason, uh, the temperature of the water should be kept at or below 71 degrees for at least one and a half hours till the exothermic heat is conducted away from the resin to the investing medium. The two methods of processing are for acrylic. Ideally, it's, one is a slow process. It is a long cycle. And the, by placing the flask in water bath at, and, main, and the temperature is maintained at 71 degrees centigrade. Remember that the boiling point of uh, monomer is 100 degrees. So you're not going to take the temperature of water s directly to 100 degrees. You will be maintaining in the slow process at 71 degrees for nine hours. The other process is a fast process, a short curing cycle, in which the flask is placed in a water bath at 74 degrees centigrade for two hours and then the temperature is raised slowly to 100 degrees for for the two hours uh, but this process although it is quick uh, yet it uh, you you can't be sure about what kind of acrylic processing would be there so uh, the ideal is slow processing but you can always go for this but you need to be very careful very particular about the, te the temperature and also the time that is used for processing after the processing is done, after the curing process is done, whichever method you are using, you must turn off the, the water bath, the, the burner of the water bath or the, the unit of the water bath, and you should allow it to cool down. It should cool within the water itself. If you take it out from the water, from the hot water and place it outside, what's going to happen, or place cold water immediately on this hot flask, What's going to happen is that the acrylic would go under the process of warpage. That warpage is that it, it will distort in the flask and it will start shrinking. So there will be contraction and shrinking of the acrylic and all of your hard work would be gone waste. So uh, this is the video of mixing of acrylic. So once the cold mold seal has set, you can... you you need to give some time for the cold mold seal to set, the, which is a separating medium which was applied. You can check the, by touching the, the surface of the, of, of the cold mold seal and it shouldn't stick to your fingers. With the help of a cotton bud and dipped in monomer, you can clean the clasp surfaces of the cold mold seal because you want acrylic to you know, at least bond with, this, uh, with these clasps. Similarly, you will be cleaning the surfaces of uh, the, uh, the artificial teeth also because if there are any cold mold seal present on the tooth surfaces, uh, acrylic will not bond to those teeth. So you need to make sure that acrylic tooth surfaces are all clean and are uh, uh, devoid of any uh, cold mold seals. So this is the, this, this stage is still not yet achieved for the uh, acrylic dough to form it's still in this in the stringy stage now once the dough stage is formed remember it does not stick to your fingers it can be easily broken off uh, into two pieces now this acrylic is packed in the upper member of the flask and then uh, the trial packing is done uh, you can place cellophane sheet inside initially you can close it with your hands and then you can press place it in a press uh, I haven't shown the trial packing stage in this. I had shown you in, in the pictures. Uh, the press is slowly tightened up and excess acrylic, as can be seen in this video, excess acrylic will be coming out, as can be seen over here. Once excess acrylic comes out, you will keep this uh, flask pressed in this press for uh, till this acrylic becomes comes into a plastic stage. That is a stage when acrylic has reached the uh, cross the rubbery stage and it will not distort now. So after this, you will be placing uh, the acrylic in the, in the press and then you're placing it in the water bath. So this is uh, acrylic is supposed, supposed to be present in the press or in the press of your flasks uh, at least for one hour before you place it in a water bath. The water bath is supposed to be uh, at room temperature. This is the water bath, acrylic 
the electronic water bath and in this the temperature can be controlled easily uh, and maintained at the temperature that you want the other one is the water bath on the, on the burner on which the temperature cannot be controlled that easily so you will place after the after you have uh, kept the, the flasks in the acrylic in the in its concept concerned press you will be placing the press in this room temperature water in the acrylic curing unit and then you will start the unit. You can use this and also use the water bath also, the burner and the water bath. The curing process, as I had mentioned the curing processes, you can go for a long curing process which is going to be for 9 hours and you can go for a short curing process which normally comprises of 4 hours, uh, 2 hours at 71 degrees and then two and a half hours for at 100 degrees and then slowly slow cured down. So in the video uh, they have they're placing the, the press in the curing unit and they'll be placing whatever time that you have decided for the curing process you can use that and after the curing process is done then the water is allowed to cool and then you will take out the flasks from the cool cold water. But do not take it out immediately from the hot water because then it will lead to a process which is called warpage. This is the distortion of uh, the acrylic. After this, the, this process is called de-vax, de-flasking. After the flask is cooled down, the chambers are removed from the press as can be seen over here and they are slowly and closely separated from each other. If you have applied Vaseline, it will remove easily from the top from the members. Now you have to be very careful. Now you can see that there is a separation between the soft plaster and the hard plaster. You will be hitting on the border so that this would separate easily. Don't hit too hard and so that you don't you don't break the acrylic flask, uh, acrylic base plate that you have cured. Do it carefully. Uh, not with the hard strokes but normal gentle strokes on the plaster it will break and then you can easily remove the uh, denture base. If you are careful you can, be, uh, you can be sure that you can also save the cast also which will help in reseating of the denture base on the cast but if it breaks off yes you should have a separate duplicate cast on which you are going to work and place fit the denture on that duplicate cast. So he, the, the technician is, is uh, sl slowly breaking off the plaster from the denture base plate. Carefully, you shouldn't exert a lot of pressure on it because if you exert a lot of pressure, this is going to break the base plate. So make sure that you are very closely doing all this. Next come the finishing stage. Once you've done the finishing, well you've done the, uh, the you've removed the the denture base from and you removed all the excess plaster. Uh, with the help of an acrylic cutting bar, you will remove all the excess uh, irregularities on the denture base surface. Be very careful. If you have made a proper wax pattern, then you can be sure that you won't need a lot of finishing done required. But if there are still some irregularities that may come, so you need to remove it with an acrylic finishing bar. All the excess uh, irregular irregularities will be removed this way. And then you can use a small diamond carbide bar or a uh, sandblasting uh, machine to remove the excess plaster that is uh, this is the soft plaster that is stuck over here. Uh, you can remove that easily with a, with a bar or with the tip of a sharp wax knife or a wax carver. Uh, remember that you're not going to be over reducing the two surfaces eventually that is going to lead to a rough surface uh, we, we, you don't want that these rough surfaces on your denture base you can always remove this excess plaster with soft with sand blasting process which is also present in our lab now comes the finishing stage after you've removed all the excess plaster you will add use a mandrel and a sandpaper 
uh, to smooth out this denture surface. Uh, eventually, this is going to create a very smooth, soft surface of the denture base because we want our dentures to be totally smooth and clean. So a sandpaper in this manner is going to be quite helpful. You will only be using sandpaper on the outer surface, the buccal surface and the parietal surface. You won't be using sandpaper on the inner surface of the denture base because we want that to be rough, not smooth. So. Uh, after you've used the sandpaper, this is a wheel on which pumice paste is used to smoothen out and to polish the denture surface. Make sure that you do not exert a lot of pressure using this wheel and the pumice paste because pumice is abrasive in nature and if you exert a lot of pressure, it will abrade the denture base. So make sure that you're not exerting a lot of pressure, just soft pressure and also make sure that you are holding as the technician is holding both the, de the denture base in, in, in the denture base in both of his hands otherwise it, the wires might get entangled in this brush and the, you might lose the denture or it can break so be very careful don't exert a lot of pressure just smooth pressure slow pressure and allow the pumice to do its work after this wash the denture base in under running water dry it and then this is a rag wheel, a polish is applied on it. Similarly, use both hands holding the denture base. Do not exert a lot of pressure. This is going to create a smooth polished surface on the denture. And this polish is used on the rag wheel. Hold both the dentures, the dentures in both of your hands. Hold it and note and keep your eyes focused on the dentures. Do not talk with your friends or anyone. Uh, no chit chat during this process because you have to be focused on this whole process. After this, with a, with a soft toothbrush and a, uh, a detergent liquid, you wash the, all the excess uh, polish that is stuck on the surfaces of the denture, wash it off, clean it, and now the denture is ready for uh, delivery. So uh, in our pictorial presentation that we had done, after the curing process, this is the, after you open up the flasks, this is a picture, this is the situation that is going to appear uh, of, after the curing is completed. So uh, after the removal of the dentures from the curing flasks, we have, uh, this is what's left out, this is the denture base, the, that, the partial dentures that are now present. So we will be removing excess acrylic. Uh, we will be removing excess acrylic with a wheel or acrylic cutting burr that I, I had shown in the video. Uh, when you're using a, uh, the, the wheel as the uh, excess acrylic cutting, make sure that you're holding it with both of the hands and be, you should mark out the boundaries and the, uh, the limits of the denture where you, till where you're going to cut out. You, uh, you have to be very careful that you don't overcut the wax pattern. The, the, the initial design of the denture. So uh, this is the, the, the gross cutting has already been completed. Now we'll be using a stone burr or we'll be using a sandpaper in a mandrel. Both can be used. The stone burr is uh, done, the, the stone burr that is used is normally coarse, uh, fine and super fine. They come in different colors. So you have to use the stone with a slow motion. Do not use a stone burr with a high speed. It's going to cause more cutting. You've already done the excess cutting. So you just need to smoothen out. And then with the sandpaper and the mandrel, you can smooth out the rest of the process and make it more polished. And after that, you will be <coughs> you know, polishing the denture uh, in, on a rag wheel, as can be seen here. You can use pumice first. Uh, use pumice, pumice slurry, and then you can go for final polishing. And this is a rag wheel on which uh, the final polishing can be done. This is going to bring out a smooth, glossy appearance. This, what the process that we use in our lab is that we'll be using pumice first. Pumice slurry and paste is used first, and then we'll be going for the brown polishing. The cake, this is going to create initial polishing. It is going to create initial smoothing of the denture base. And then we use a white polish uh, or a pink polishing uh, block, which is used on another rag wheel. Uh, we don't mix the both polishes on the same wheel. And that is going to create more shine in this denture surface and it will be the final finishing. 
you should always have a duplicate cast before you go for a processing of acrylic because then you need to adjust the dentures back on the cast and in this way you will get an idea that the dentures that you've made are properly made and they are going to fit on the denture surface on the partially denture arch of the cast as well as on the patient if you don't do this you won't get an idea at if there are any discrepancies that happened in the during the curing process and if you don't do this you will have to spend a lot of time on the chair side and the patient will also lose confidence in you. So always, always make a duplicate cast of your work that you're going to do. I will also be telling all of you to do this uh, exercise on, uh, on the duplicate casts also, uh, so that you get an idea what we are talking about. So I hope this uh, lecture has helped you in understanding the process. I've tried to make it as elaborative as possible. Uh, we'll also be doing the same process. Luckily, our labs have started. You are also, we're all coming here for the lab exercises. Do refer this back to this lecture whenever you reach this stage of the laboratory process, inshallah. I'll also be uploading a video on, the, on YouTube of the whole process also. So uh, do come up with questions if you have any. And thank you for your patient listening.